All right, all right. What's up, Greenville? What's up, buddy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good to see everybody. Man, y'all the super Christians. Y'all the ones that show up when you lose an hour of sleep. Yeah, you're all the ones. I, I'm actually amazed that we have so many people here, especially after losing that hour of sleep. Uh, I'm kind of marveling at this, at this view that I get to have. What are some things that amaze you or things that you might marvel at or be astonished by? What are some things? My kids. Ah, kids, man. There's, there's something amazing about kids that we can just, uh, mainly when they're little. When we grow up, not so much. We don't like them as much. But when they're little, man, I mean, it's like they're awesome. They're special. It's like, wow, I made that, right? It's kind of a cool thing. Uh, I think I heard Jan say sunsets or sunrises, both. I mean, is that not the most beautiful thing to see. Who saw the moon last night? Yeah. Or this morning? Yeah, I mean, when I woke up this morning and looked over from the house this way, uh, I could see the church and then the moon and some clouds kind of covering parts of the moon, but it was a full bright moon that just powered through those clouds. It was pretty awesome. What are some other things that we find amazing and shocking that we marvel at? The ocean. The ocean. All right. There's some people I've heard that haven't had a chance to go to the ocean, but it is amazing. I mean, when you see that, you're just in awe of it. What else? DNA. Huh? DNA? DNA. <laughs> yes. The, the Bill Nye, the science guy back there. DNA. That's right. That's right. No, but but no, you're right. Uh, Brian's absolutely correct. When you when you think about DNA and the complexities of it and it's just remarkable and overwhelming to even think about. What are some other things? Airplanes can fly. I, look, I, I worked at UPS for 27 years, and I still geek out about the airplanes, man. The fact that they, that they can get that hunk of tin up in the air blows me away. It's pretty awesome. What else? What about life? What? Life. Wife life. and life. <laughs> wife and life? <laughs> All right. So, yeah. So just life in general. Right. When you think of all kinds of life from insects to animals to human life. And then I think somebody said wife. OK, if not, I'm helping you out. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, when we look at our spouses in many cases or our family, we can be in awe and amazement of them. I remember going to the uh, Grand Canyon one time. It was it was kind of a short trip. I was there for, for business, actually, and I was in Phoenix, Arizona. And my boss said, we could drive two hours to go see the Grand Canyon, or we can hang out here in Phoenix. And I'm like, dude, I may never get to the Grand Canyon. Let's go. So, so we hop in the car. We had to hustle there, and we had to hustle back to catch our flight. But it was like 20 minutes of Grand Canyon. I mean, if you've, if you've seen Chevy Chase in, you know, vacation, you know, it was like, you hop out, put your arm around each other, and just look at it for 20, and you're gone, right? It's just quick. But it was, it was so marvelous, so amazing. My eyes literally could not take it in. It was so massive and so crazy. And uh, many things in our lives uh, can be amazing and astonishing and marvel us. Do you know that Jesus actually experienced amazement and marveled at something? Do you know what it was? Faith. He marveled at faith. It mentions it in the Gospels that document his life. And on two occasions, he marveled or was amazed at faith. One of them is in Mark chapter 6. In his hometown, Nazareth, he was amazed by their lack of faith. He was amazed by their unbelief. Now, the other time that he was amazed at faith or marveled by someone's faith, it's mentioned in the book of Luke and also in the book of Matthew. So, who do you think he marveled at? When you think of the life of Christ and who he might have marveled at, who are some people that you think 
of when you think, man, they, they had faith. Maybe Peter, John, Matthew, one of the disciples. Maybe he's looking back at his mom and dad and saying, hey, you know, my mom and dad had some awesome faith. I remember them telling me stories about what they went through when I was born. That took a lot of faith. You know, who was he, whose faith was he amazed by or marveled at? It was a centurion, a soldier. He marveled at the faith of the soldier. And we're going to look at that today because I want to know more about that. What was it about the centurion's faith that he marveled at? What amazed him? What made him stop in his tracks and say, OM me, I cannot believe the, the faith that, that he has. That's a good one, right? That's right. That's right. So I would like for you to turn to the book of Luke, which is one of the gospels. So about midway through the Bible, you'll find Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're going to be in the book of Luke, specifically chapter 7. So Luke chapter 7, verse 1 through 10. So I will tell you this real quick. There are actually two accounts or two people that speak to this particular incident or the centurion's faith. Uh, you can read about it in the book of Matthew, uh, which is chapter 8. His is kind of more of a condensed, get to the point uh, version. And then we're going to read uh, Luke. Uh, chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. That's where we're going to uh, kind of make our home base, basically, as far as reading the scripture. And I might pull some stuff from Matthew that might enhance um, their testimonies. So there's a couple things that I want us to remember. So when we sit and we're thinking about what Jesus marveled at, we know it was the centurion's faith, but what is faith? So I'm going to throw these scriptures up on the screen because the the writer of Hebrews actually talks about what faith is. And in chapter 11, verse 1, he says, Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. So it's confidence and assurance. And then he goes on to say in verse 6 that it is impossible to please God without faith. It's absolutely impossible. Impossible. So when we think about faith, it's ultimately trusting God, trusting that he is in control and has, you know, all authority over that. Another thing that I want us to take into consideration before we jump into the scripture is what's a centurion? OK, uh, so a Roman centurion is a professional military officer and they commanded Platoon, a platoon of troops that were called centuries. How many soldiers do you think was in that troop? A hundred. Yeah, so right around a hundred. That's where we get century from. So a Roman centurion was the best of the best. They were the best of the best in battle. I mean, they were professionals. Not to mention they were brave, loyal. They had amazing character, a centurion did. Now, would you believe that a centurion would serve on the front line in battle? He didn't sit back and send his men forward. He stood on the front line with them, typically at the end on the right-hand side. He fought battles with them. And because they were on the front line, oftentimes they were injured or killed. That rate was real high with a centurion. They were very well paid. They were well respected. And admired by many people. So you've got this centurion who has this wealth, power, and prestige. And that made them very influential in their society or in their culture. Now, if they weren't in battle, and it was a time of peace, they oftentimes were like, like chief of police. They would keep the peace in the area that they were stationed in, or they would kind of manage things from collecting taxes to uh, all, kind, all sorts of things. They were kind of like a governor in many cases uh, when they weren't leading in battle. 
But one thing we also need to keep in mind is ultimately the Jews and centurions didn't like each other much because it was the Romans that occupied that territory and that area. And whenever you're under someone's rule, which was Roman rule, and you didn't want to be, but they conquered you and occupied your your space and allowed you to live under their laws, their rules, their beliefs, then, uh, you know, you might be a little bitter about that. So they, they had some issues with each other more times than not. Before we jump into the scripture, we need to also keep in mind just what happened before that that leads up to this. Jesus had just given the most famous sermon ever given, the Sermon on the Mount. So on the side of a mountain, uh, given the ser- uh, sermon, he, he basically talked about how we're supposed to live, that we're supposed to live dedicated lives, that we live in a way that is pleasing to God. We don't go around acting all hypocritical, basically saying one thing, but yet doing another, that we are to be loving, full of grace, full of mercy, full of wisdom, and make good judgments. That's really a summary of the Sermon on the Mount. And then we come to this particular passage in Scripture in chapter 7, which verse 1 says, When Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. So Capernaum is now his home base because remember the people of Nazareth kind of turned on him. They had, they had a lack of faith, didn't want to have anything to do with him. He left and went to Capernaum. Verse two, there a centurion servant who his master valued highly was sick and about to die. Now, Matthew adds to that by saying that the servant was paralyzed and that the the servant was suffering terribly. And then verse 3. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him. Check this out. Here's what they said. This man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. So here's my question uh, before we continue. What, what is it that, that makes us feel like we deserve something from Jesus? What does it take for us to feel like that we deserve something from God? Is healing power truly distributed based off our works, based off merit, the things that we do that we somehow earn a healing? They obviously, when we read it, they felt the need to persuade Jesus. Listen, Jesus, Jesus, listen. This guy's awesome. This guy loves the Jewish people, your people, God's people. He loves our nation. He even built us a synagogue so we can worship. You should definitely heal this man's servant because of that. Don't we do that when it comes to dealing with God? Don't we feel like we deserve something based off of what we do, kind of the merit that we've earned. And, and if for some reason we haven't earned it and we recognize that we haven't earned it, when we go before God and we talk to him and we pray with him, don't we bargain with him? Lord God, I know I've been like a suck follower up to this point, but if you heal this person in my life, if you heal me, Lord, from now on, I will earn that. I'll pay that debt off. Of what you did for me, I will now do these things. Don't we do that? Much like the elders did in this particular passage of Scripture. But clearly he was kind and generous uh, to the Jewish nation. Is that why Jesus went? It, it did say Jesus, did they persuade him? One thing I want to take time out and say is 
If you were to set Luke's account and Matthew's account side by side, you might find what you think is a discrepancy or a contradiction. Because in the book of Matthew, he says that the centurion goes to Jesus and speaks with Jesus. When clearly in Luke, it, it's happening through the elders. So a lot of times people go, yeah, see, see, Scripture's all screwed up. It doesn't, it doesn't match. It doesn't job. There's all kinds of contradictions throughout Scripture. But if you sit and you think about it and you read it, a lot of times things like that can be easily explained. If a man who had authority sends a representative to speak on their behalf, when it's a person of authority, it's as if they said it. Hear me out. So when I was little, I would go out and play football, play basketball, whatever the case may be. And then it gets, gets late time for dinner. Mom would send one of my brothers out to get me. Go get your brother. Tell him to get home now. I don't want to have to tell him three times or I will beat him with a switch. You tell him to come home. Brother, come tell me I got to go. I'm with the guys. What? What? What do you want? Mom said you got to go home. And you start, man, and you kind of stomp off pouting. You got to go back home. And your friends go, hey, where are you going? Where are you going? Do you say my brother said I had to go home? No. He said, mama's going to beat me with a switch if I don't go home. And they're like, oh, yeah, we get it. it. But it was my brother that told me it wasn't my mom. But she speaks with authority. And therefore, whenever somebody tells me that she said, it's as if she said it directly to me. And that actually happened in Scripture. In Mark chapter 6, chapter six verse 16. Remember when uh, Herod had John the Baptist uh, beheaded? Right? He actually ordered them to behead. John the Baptist. But then we read in Mark 6, 16, it says, But when Herod heard this, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. Oh, well, there's a contradiction. He's saying here he cut his head off. Over here it's saying he ordered. Which is it? The Bible's full of discrepancies. No, he's a man of authority. He, I did it. Even though it wasn't my hands, I ordered it. Therefore, I did it. So we need not get too bent out of shape about the way that it is written and to the audiences that it's written to when we're reading Matthew and Luke side by side in this particular situation. So I did want to share that with you. And honestly, it helps me to believe this to be more the word of God than if they would have written the exact same thing. Because if it was the exact same thing, I would be, they just copied off each other and wrote wrote their letters or whatever the case may be, or their, their view. So let's continue uh, reading. And, and let me say this first. So the, remember, the elders were talking about the centurion's merit, that he earned the right. But let's look at the perspective of the centurion, what he has to say about it. And again, we're, just, we're still in uh, verse 6. Where it said Jesus went with them, and then he, talking about Jesus, he was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. Stop for a second. The centurion made good money. Do you think he lived in a dump? No, he had a very nice home. You can guarantee that. But he's saying, I'm not worthy to have you come into my home. It wasn't like, oh, Lord, I haven't had a chance to clean yet. You can't come over now. No, I'm not worthy for you to come into my home. That is why I did not consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word. Let me repeat that. But say the word. And my servant will be healed. Verse 8. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. 
I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. Let's stop for just a second. So just trying to figure out what's going on here. Clearly, the uh, centurion is a God-fearing man. He recognizes the authority of Jesus. Now, keep in mind, listen, that the centurion is under Roman authority, the emperor or Herod, right? That is who his uh, who has authority over him. But he's recognizing Jesus' authority. He recognized his authority so much that he calls him Lord. That in itself could have gotten him killed by calling Jesus Lord. Calling him master, ruler. What kind of humility would it take for a centurion to go to a Jew? Not somebody in authority over him, but to go to a Jew and call him Lord. And he even could kind of compare saying, I can relate to you, Jesus. I am in authority. I have authority over my soldiers and you have authority over us. But listen, I also have someone who is in authority over me, just like you do. And he recognizes in that moment that God the Father has authority over Jesus. Yet, Jesus also has authority over all things. So much to the point that he says, just say the word. Just say it. Just speak it. You don't even have to come. I know you have the power to heal my servant in just a spoken word. Not Mr. Miyagi. And then healing. No, just say the word. What humility. What recognition of authority the centurion had. Verse 9. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed, marveled, astonished at him, amazed at him. And turning to the crowd, following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. I want to repeat that. The people are following Jesus. And, and I'm not talking about just the 12. Hundreds of people following Jesus. And he turns to the crowd and says, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. We have to pause for just a minute and recognize what just happened. This rabbi, teacher, prophet spoke a word and a man who was on his deathbed paralyzed sick, probably full of disease, dying. I have witnessed three people dear to me who I love and been at their side when they took their last breath. I know what death looks like. And imagine like that. They open their eyes and they get up. That is divine authority. Don't let that slip by. He is who he said he was. So the statement that he made that I tell you I've not found such great faith even in Israel. 
This is a huge statement, y'all. It's easy to read past that, but who was Israel? God's people. They were the ones that, look, this is the bloodline. These are the ones that are going to inherit the kingdom of God. These are the people that would know who the Messiah was. These are the people who would, would have been taught everything about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They would know everything. They should have the most faith. And he points out a Gentile, which is really a non-Jew. A Gentile who is probably pagan, worships other gods, but also fears God, Yahweh, the God of the Jews. And Jesus says, that guy has more faith than y'all. What do you think they were thinking in that moment? I cannot believe what he just said. I'm offended by what you just said. The teachers of the law, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were flipping out, losing their minds in this moment. Because he's saying a Gentile, someone who hasn't dedicated their life to God, who is not in the bloodline, the Jewish bloodline, that guy, you're saying has more faith than us? Don't miss that. That is profound what he said. It's not about the works that the, that the elders mentioned. It's not about the things that they did, but about his faith and recognizing the authority of Jesus. Think about what Ryan taught about last week when he talked about the disciples in the boat with Jesus. And they're out in the middle of the lake and there's a huge storm and waves. They're intimidated by the waves. What was their faith like? They had a lot of unbelief. They struggled with their faith with Jesus in the boat. And then you compare to the centurion who humbles himself before Jesus and recognizes his authority. So what is our response to this scripture? What do we do with it? Do we just say, oh man, that's really cool. That's neat that he, that he healed somebody by just speaking the word. But what does that mean for us? What is the takeaway? The takeaway, listen to me, the takeaway is that we have faith like the centurion. That we have centurion faith. And what does that look like? How do we live that out? There's two things, two ways that we can live that out. It's a time that we live it out. And how do we live it out? We live it out like this. By recognizing that we're not worthy. We're not. Think Wayne's world. We're not worthy. We're not worthy. We're not. None of us are. And if we think that, well, if I'm a deacon and I give so much money and I serve down in the preschool and, you know, I'm generous. And did I mention that I serve in the preschool? And we say all these things. And maybe even you 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 did missions and you went and you built a church and you preached God's word to people. You're still not worthy. We're still not because we're talking about a perfect God. A God without sin. So when we are comparing our goodness with God, it's not even close. But many of us, if we were polled and asked, are you good? Oh, we would be a little humble. We'd be like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm pretty awesome. <laughs> I mean, sometimes I make mistakes, but aside from the mistakes here and there, I'm, I'm pretty good and amazing. We, we think that. And if, if you feel like you don't think that, you're lying to yourself. We feel like we somehow earn that right to, for God or Jesus to do things for us. You know, we, 
I hear a lot of people give millennials a hard time about um, about being entitled. Uh, millennials, they're all they all act so entitled. They just want things given to them. First of all, that's stupid. Okay, that just is not the case. Uh, the way that we talk about it, because we're all acting that way. We all act entitled. We expect God to answer our prayers. We expect God to do stuff for us because we've somehow earned that right. Now, I'm not saying that, well, we need to do more works. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is that no matter how many works we do, how many boxes we check off, we are still not worthy of him to even pay any attention to us. But he does. And if you're wondering if you feel if you feel like you're a person that is entitled, we can ask ourselves this question. Do we get upset when God doesn't answer our prayers or do things the way we think that he should in our lives? Think about that for a second. I get mad, ticked off all the time. If we do, then there has to be some type of entitlement inside because we feel like, look, I, I deserve this. We deserve this. Why aren't you? Why aren't you taking care of me and doing these things? As opposed to the centurion who who just humbled himself and you have all authority, Lord. Lord. Another way is to live life like Jesus has authority. So live life like we're not worthy, but live life like Jesus has all authority, that God has all authority, that his spirit that lives in us as baptized believers in Christ, that that spirit has authority, that Jesus has authority, that God the Father has authority. Why? Because he's God. And if the spirit of God truly lives in us and we give that spirit authority in our lives, then why do we fear? Why do we have anxiety? It's because we won't give him authority over our lives. But when we do that, because we know that he loves us, we know that he created each of us special and unique, that he created us in a way that we could enjoy life. That we could enjoy a sunset. That we could enjoy our children and laugh. Think about that. That we can smile and feel joy and laugh. God gave us the ability to do that. He gave us the ability, I know I got a young one, plug his ears. He gave us the ability that when we're older and we experience marriage and we dedicate our lives to one person, that we can enjoy having sex with that one person for the rest of our lives. He didn't have to do that. He could have made it just transactional where you walk up and Boop, and then a baby pops out. He didn't do it that way to populate the earth. He did. I mean, that's a byproduct of that. But the joy that we get from that, he did that for us as part of creation. So there's so much in creation and the things that that we experience in our life, we can see that God loves us. And it, 
So why not give him authority if he loves us? Yeah, I'll give it all to you, God. You're in control. I trust you no matter what. But if we give him authority, we trust him with our purpose. We believe he created us on purpose for a purpose and we trust him with that. And it's not my purpose for making all kinds of money and having this job that somehow gives me some some type of clout over everybody else and somebody goes, ooh, you got that job. You're, you're smart. You're special. You must have a lot of money and a lot of stuff. But when we give God authority in our lives, we do the crappy jobs that don't necessarily raise us up in our culture and in our society. Why? Because we feel God's calling us to that and created us for that. So now when I'm in a nursing home wiping somebody's butt and cleaning them and loving them and building relationships with them and stuff like that, that I'm called to do or that I choose to teach kids which doesn't pay anything rather than do stuff that that makes me feel like I can retire well and on a beach somewhere. When we give God authority in our lives, it changes the way that we live. It changes the way that we pray. It changes the way that we ask for things. Why? Because when we ask and we pray and we talk to him, we talk to him in a way that shows that he has authority. We're obedient. For some of us, that might be a big word. We're like, what do you mean by obedient? We do what God says that we're supposed to do. We live our lives the way Jesus demonstrated that we're supposed to live. Not because it's necessarily what I want to, because I have this God complex that I am in authority over my life and I want to do what I want. But when we give God authority, the things that we do, the way that we live, being obedient, doing what he says we do. Why? Because he has authority. I cleaned my room when I was a little kid, not because I wanted to. It's because my parents had authority and I trusted their authority. I had faith in them. We should trust God and be obedient and have faith in Him. We must trust Him. Demonstrate faith in Him by humbling ourselves and admitting that we're not worthy, but also giving God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit authority in our lives. Then, maybe, maybe Jesus will marvel and be astonished and say, oh, in me, look at the faith because of their humility and because they recognize my authority. I pray for that day. Let's pray together. Lord God, we love you. We praise you, Father. I I love to keep the authority myself. I trust in me so often. Lord God, I pray, help me to recognize that no matter what I do, I'm not worthy. And not so much that you beat me down with it. I know you don't. But hopefully it just helps me to see that I need a Savior. And that is why I accept that free gift. That gift of Jesus who died on the cross for me. And I pray the same for the people in this room. Lord God, help us to trust you. Help us to give you authority. 
we pray that in the mighty name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You are dismissed. Love you guys.